Dartmouth men's basketball team voted 13 to 2 in favor of becoming the first ever labor union for college athletics. This could shake up the National Collegiate Athletics Association's model, which only allows them to financially benefit through name, image, and likeness. Joining us right now to talk about the potential ramifications of the unionization is Ben Portnoy. He is Sports Business Journal College sports reporter. Um, ben, this is kind of amazing because college athletics have changed so much since NIL was allowed in, since the players started making money. Um, what are the potential ramifications of this unionization vote? Yeah, I think the big thing here is, I mean, first off, look, this is a monumental moment for college athletics, right? Nothing super similar to this has happened, at least as far as actually getting a union vote together and piecing together something this this sort of distinct. Now, there's been similar cases. Yeah, with right. Northwestern. The, Right. There's Northwestern piece is part of it, but nothing has gotten this public, I should say, at least this far down the line, this official. And I think that the important piece with this, when you look at it, is that Dartmouth, it's a private school. The Ivy League is made up of very similar schools. I think the impact you're going to see with this case and specifically is just on the, the sort of Ivy League, the private schools, at least in the interim, right? Now, that said, I think this also can be a precursor to a couple of other things that are kind of making their way through the courts, whether that's with the NLRB or elsewhere. Uh, that I think will have a little bit larger ramifications as far as for some of these power five and high major schools. But I think this is kind of the first step in seeing uh, a more widespread employment in college athletics. And I think it's been trending that way for a long time, but this is sort of the first big, big, big step and sort of first distinct step that we've seen at least in the last kind of year. I mean, Ivy Leagues are interesting in particular because they don't even offer um, scholarships to the students who, who play on these teams. What would happen if this goes forward? Because the courts have been pretty friendly to the athletes in all of these cases that have made it. Yeah, and I think that's an important distinction here, right? You look at Ivy League schools, and I think, frankly, that's the concern for a lot of administrators, at least at the Ivy League level, at the Division II, Division III level, and sort of where you might see a lot of the ramifications of this unionization in this case uh, sort of play out. And I think that the reality is, and, and Dartmouth argued this yesterday and its appeal that it's filed now, and, and this will obviously weave its way through the courts, but uh, is that the Dartmouth men's basketball team loses hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And I think that that's not necessarily unique in, in college athletics, at least at that level. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of schools that say, if our athletes are employees, if, you know, we have to pay college athletes, especially again at the D2, D3 level, there's a lot of schools that frankly can't afford it. And I think that that becomes a bigger issue as far as what does athletics at that level look like. Now, again, we're talking about kind of- they would shut down these programs if they were allowed to unionize? You know, I think that no one wants to shut down programs, but I think you could see more widespread things like club athlete, club sports. Uh, do schools end up offering less sports? You know, the D1 minimum right now, I believe is 14. You know, does do Division One schools end up start sponsoring, what is it, four, five, six school sports instead of, you know, 22 or, you know, places like Stanford and, that have more than 30? Uh, I, I think it depends. And I think we're still a ways from getting an exact ruling there, getting an exact sort of idea of what that might look like. But again, I think that at the D2, D3 level, it's a huge, huge problem for schools, again, that that are sponsoring sports, not necessarily that are making not making the money that you talk about when we talk about sort of high major I mean, division one sports have changed so much with the name image and image and likeness where you have some players who can make a couple hundred thousand dollars playing on a team and others who get nothing it it has been a strange and interesting thing to watch you think that there's going to be more equity that eventually works its way into d1 too I, look, I think that the market's going to sort itself out on some on some level, right? I think that this is a new industry, for lack of a better term. Uh, and I think that when you look at that and you look at what NIL has been, right, it's sort of been the market figuring itself out. You know, there's been football players at the high major level that are making, you know, multi-million dollar contracts over the course of their four years in school. And I think that, you know, if you look at trends in the NFL and things like that, right, look, quarterbacks are going to make more money than the third string offensive linemen. And I think that you know, whether things are equal across the board, I, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think that you're going to see, again, the market will sort of start to figure itself out. And I think that when you have the combination confluence of the transfer portal, NIL, it's created some of this this mess that we see, or at least why college sports have been thrown into a little bit of chaos, at least in, in recent years.